This is Strat News Global. I'm Amita Bravi and our guest today is Tibetan writer and author Tenzin Sundu. Tenzin, really appreciate you taking us uh, some time for us. Thank you for having me. Since I just wanted to get an overview of the situation in Tibet, but I'm using a recentish news peg, a UN report which says that over one million Tibetan school children have been forcibly taken away from their families and put into Chinese boarding schools. Now, using that, can you just elucidate what the situation in terms of repression and coercion inside Tibet is? The situation inside Tibet today is at the highest level of repression, brutality, and surveillance to a point people know that even one photograph of the Dalai Lama yeah. in, their fo in their phone is known by the Chinese government. And this is the level where about a million Tibetan children are forced into colonial school boarding, uh, boarding schools where children are given Chinese language education and their right to study, know, learn Tibetan language has been deprived to them. This has come to where China's 70 years of occupation of Tibet has brought to more than a million Tibetans losing their life and about 6,000 monasteries destroyed. And today we, we are at a situation where Tibetan nomads and farmers are losing their land all to China's money. Those mining then go to China, make cheap made in China products, and China sell it to places around the world. And this is where Tibet is having to pay the cost for China's economy and also what is called the development uh, yeah. to countries around the world. Again, if I just look at the, some new moves, I think there was a seminar where there were a lot of scholars, and there's this move to try and uh, use the opinion name for Tibet more. Uh, how, how, why would the Chinese be trying to do that? We face the same in, say, in Arunachal Pradesh, where they, they name places according to uh, Chinese language. Yeah. See, uh, China's attempt to rename Tibet, English language Tibet, or from, from Hindi, Tibet, it's uh, disconcerting and um, inconvenient for China, because China looks at Tibet today as what China calls Xi Zhang, yeah. which actually means Western Treasure House. So they look at Tibet as a source of their natural resources from where they could take those natural resources and continue to churn out cheap made in China products. They do not respect the Tibetan people, language, culture. And they continue to say that Tibet is a, Tibetan people are a minority. But there's no minority rights. But then this was not how China looked at Tibet. Traditionally, China looked at Tibet as what is called the Trufan. Trufan actually meant, me meant that China looked at Tibet as the place of wisdom. Entire China's mi uh, mythology uh, of the monkey and the, uh, and the pig story, just like how Ramayan Mahabharata is in India, their mythology, their entire history was there in search of going to Trufan, the place of wisdom. Now China looks at Tibet as a source of natural resources. This is where, where we have come to today. I know you have very strong views on this, but I'd like to get an overview of what you think of India's Tibet policy. India's Tibet policy, as His Holiness the Dalai Lama has again and again said, it's overcautious. And it has not changed uh, so much. Uh, it, India's uh, Tibet policy started from uh, Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai 1954 Panchila Agreement, where India w was one of the first to recognize Tibet as a part of China. Um, now, linguistically, there have been certain uh, changes that have come about ever since Atal Bihari Vajpayee took the helms of the administration. Uh, instead of saying Tibet blanketly, India started to say. Tibet autonomous region is a part of China, uh, which uh, then recognizes only a part of Tibet as part of China. Um, and then we must also notice that since 2008, India has stopped giving China the free certificate, certificate that Tibet is a part of China. Uh, and I think these are slow, slow uh, developments. It's not about political parties. It's just generally India is much more assertive. It's much more confident of its own policies. And now India is a global player. Talking about being a global player now, 
Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President Xi Jinping had a conversation which was on uh, camera in Bali during the G20 in Indonesia in November. They've had a conversation where both sides have issued statements now at BRICS. There are two more opportunities possibly. One is the East Asia uh, conference and the ASEAN conference in Indonesia early, Japan, early uh, September and then days later the G20 summit in Delhi itself. Meanwhile, officials of various levels which find a part in the statement are looking at ways to kind of cool down temperatures. How do you view all of this? Um, these are uh, these latest uh, moves from both China and India's uh, sides. We should not look into that too much. Uh, these are more inspired or compelled because of their local policies. So uh, there, is an, there is an election happening uh, next year. Uh, Xi Jinping has a lot of uh, enemies from within the political party. He's very, very in insecure. He's actually one of the most threatened personalities in the entire China where of course, he has himself vanished many people, <laughs> including uh, uh, Jack Mao for a brief period of, period of time. Um, at the same time, he himself is a threatened person. So many of these policies uh, may have been and uh, may be continuing to uh, come about from local uh, immediate uh, policies. But uh, overall, I see uh, that ever since Galwan, India has recognized China as enemy number one, just as how George Fernandez earlier uh, had said. Um, so I think these are uh, larger changes and India is not going to forget Galwan Valley. Uh, India uh, and uh, India's uh, aspiration, India is rising to a point uh, because of its uh, uh, youthful population, uh, our level of education here, um, and also global aspiration. Uh, we are continuing to uh, look at China either as a competitor um, or, or, and mostly as an, as an enemy. Sure. I mean, this is all, of course, contingent of whether Xi Jinping goes to Indonesia and comes to Delhi as well. But how do you, if he does come for the G20 summit, what is that line that uh, Tibetan activists would look at in terms of, obviously, you would want to protest. You'd protest whether he comes or he doesn't uh, come. But if he comes, probably more. And dealing with the sensitivities of India being one, the host for the Tibetan people, yeah. and two, host for an important summit. How do you tread that? I think it is, it is important for all, all of us as Tibetans living in India and people like us who are born and brought up in India that we are very sensitive to India's emotion that uh, India is having to um, host the G20 uh, summit for the first time. It is prestige of India. We are very, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very aware of this. Uh, but India must also know that this is same Xi Jinping who is a dictator in his own country, who has occupied Tibet, East Turkestan, Southern Mongolia, Manchuria for the past 70 years and constantly tries to threaten India. And whenever he had come in the past three times, he had always sent PLA soldiers doing incursions into Indian territory. And, uh, uh, and both of us who, uh, would not be surprised that if he did the same thing. So we have more concerns from Xi Jinping and less about Tibetan activists. Tibetan activists, we, I mean, India is such, especially New Delhi, is such a high security area. We may not be able to do too much, but I think some attempts will be made. But concerns should be about the border. Xi Jinping definitely will do something on the borders, even as he uh, comes here. And he would use this as bargaining chip against India. The hope among some is that instead of doing something on the border that is aggressive, possibly if they return to some positions of uh, disengagement or de-escalation. But anyway, that's for the future. You talked about the border areas. If I can just break them into two parts, the, the, the western and the eastern part. And first, your... Uh, views on what has happened in Ladakh, especially in East Ladakh, post uh, Galwan? I think uh, uh, right after Galwan Valley, the, the tremendous pressure on Indian armed forces, uh, um, because we have uh, suffered a debacle, um, um, and having to um, be more assertive. At the same time, then all the um, policies of uh, de-escalation and uh, uh, calm down. Uh, these are confusing uh, moments. At the same time, I think Indian armed forces have proved that we are strong. We are not given to give up. We are, we are there. Uh, but uh, 
also we had seen in certain places, especially in um, uh, Guyul, uh, Shushul area, uh, there are some grazing grounds uh, from India side now not being al allowed for, for Indian nomads. And this would mean a loss of grazing grounds for, for people. So these have now become the new um, no, no man's land. Um, and that's, that, that's a loss uh, from, from our side. Um, I think when it comes to border areas, uh, how much ever we say in the media, on the outside, we should practice that on ground. And if I can move now to the eastern sector where we covered extensively, especially in Arunachal Pradesh and Tawang sector, and the Chumi Gyatse, or holy waterfalls, extremely significant for Tibetan Buddhists on both sides, but now, of course, from the other side, uh, they can hardly do anything except possibly watch it. Your thoughts about Arunachal Pradesh and how China claims it as southern Tibet? See, Arunachal Pradesh, um, however we look at it, initially used to be a part of what's called the NIFA, Northeastern Frontier Agency. Uh, in, the, in the history, till 1914, uh, McMahon Line uh, Treaty Agreement, it was part of Tibet. And the uh, McMahon Treaty was signed in 1914, which was going to be part of the similar uh, agreement uh, where China did not sign. But McMahon Treaty was a bilateral treaty between Tibet, independent Tibet, and British India. And there was no China there at all. So India has... Uh, uh, legal claims, historical claims, and documented, documentational claims on this. And China has no business to talk about Arunachal Pradesh at all. Um, administratively, till February of 1951, Arunachal Pradesh had uh, uh, remained uh, administratively part of Tibet, but from, from February 1951 onwards, it had become part of India. And again, there was no China business there at all. So I don't understand why China continues, continues to say that Arunachal Pradesh is a part of uh, 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 southern Tibet. Uh, problem here is when India recognizes Tibet autonomous region as part of uh, China, then there is, th th it leaves space for misinterpretation by China. Uh, in, uh, India must, just as how India says, we have Indo-Tibetan Border Police, IDPP. We must look at um, uh, Mekhmun Line Treaty uh, point and also many other uh, borders in the Himalayas as Tibet border. I think this would give clarification to our people and also to, uh, to China. And, uh, and recent, uh, this year, United States passed a resolution supporting Mekhmun Line uh, Treaty on the, and, uh, and the line as, uh, as India's legitimate, le legitimate border. So China has no business here at all. Sure. I mean, the government doesn't do that, but when we report, we do call it the Tibetan border and we do say it's China-occupied uh, Tibet. But That's important. I think every Indian should say <laughs> Himalayan border with Tibet is Tibet border. And But the corollary to that, the official position, whether it's uh, among uh, normal Tibetans or the government in exile, is that Arunachal Pradesh is not part of Tibet? Is that also an His official Holiness position? the Dalai Lama had been there I yeah. think almost about seven, eight times. Yeah. Every time he goes there, this is a recognition that this is part of India and China has no business about it. And whenever His Holiness goes there, almost about 40 to uh, 50, 60,000 people gather there, including people from Bhutan and Nepal and all over Arunachal Pradesh. And this is then, this becomes the biggest statement mm -hmm. that this entire people look at this uh, Arunachal Pradesh, especially Tawang region, as part of India. It's a very clear sign. What is your information, Tenzin, about uh, Tibetans being inducted coercively or not? We don't have any information about that uh, into the PLA. And uh, also, if you could add Tibetans in the Special Frontier Forces. Well, see, uh, Special Frontier Force was first set up here towards the end of 1962 after China's invasion of India in the Ar Ar Arunachal Pradesh area. Uh, and this has been going on all this time, but secretively. Uh, on the other side, uh, China's induction or recruitment of Tibetan, uh, what is called the militia, uh, um, uh, happened after Galwan Valley.
So whenever we see, if you see any of the report, Chinese reports about uh, their recruitment of Tibetans in, uh, uh, for their uh, border security, you will see that they never mention that the Tibetans they recruited are part of PLA. These are militia. These are randomly uh, uh, soldiers that are randomly picked up for their own purposes that they would decide. So which would mean they are not a part of regular PLA, one, number one. Number two, when they talk about it, they always highlight one thing, that they, all the soldiers are getting all um, facilities and perks. These right. were more uh, prominently reported than their being part of any uh, important uh, uh, part of the security uh, 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 accessories. So I look at this as China's psychological war tactic against India to break down the morale of SFF soldiers. Um, because SFF soldiers, uh, their situation in, in India, uh, looking at the way they are treating their own soldiers in, in the way they, they are treating. Uh, we don't so, know. so we actually see that this is more of a this, uh, of a, of a psych uh, psychological tactic. But they may, it may also come to a point that they may use Tibetans on the on the Himalayan borders, and finally, we, finally, we may see Tibetans facing each other, or Tibetans killing each other on the Himalayas. One for China, one for India. Um, but I like to believe, and we keep messaging to our brothers and sisters inside Tibet. Looking at India, facing His Holiness the Dalai Lama here, how are you going to shoot at us? I let that was <laughs> speak for itself. But since you're talking about the Dalai Lama, Tenzin, what are your thoughts on succession? I mean, there's so much debate and discussion over it. The, the, the Dalai Lama himself has said, you know, I'm going to live till 113. But uh, something has to be in place and because China obviously is looking for that option to nullify the succession. How do you see that panning out? Well, this is a regular question that uh, keeps coming to <laughs> Tibetans. Um, but I think, you know, the importance is, as far as Tibetans are concerned, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has made it very clear that there would be a point of time that, that he would leave behind a written statement. Right. And that would clarify everything for, for all of us. And for us, this, that is going to be the ultimate, um, you know, call. And people across the Himalayas, uh, especially Indian uh, population and uh, uh, associations of monasteries, associations of high lamas and uh, gurus uh, are all across the Himalayas, they all have uh, you know, petitioned government of India to recognize the, the Dalai Lama's decision as the ultimate. For, from among the Tibetan community, whether Tibetans are inside Tibet or outside everywhere, we all uh, uh, respect His Holiness Dalai Lama as the ultimate uh, call. And United States has also passed that kind of uh, resolution. Um, so as far as Tibetans are concerned, I don't see there's a, there's a problem. Um, uh, the transition, which is going to be the 15th one, this will happen. Um, but I think, uh, as His Holiness says, China is more worried about the Dalai Lama's reincarnation than the Dalai Lama himself. Um, so I think uh, this is it. But then the issue of, of, uh, of the Dalai Lama's reincarnation has now become international. It is now no longer a Tibetan uh, issue alone. United States is worried, so is India, uh, so are many other uh, stakeholders. And China will be the number one who will be worried about it. But uh, all said and done, we should still look at his Holiness, the Dalai Lama's, uh, you know, regular uh, words that he's, he's been saying that he's going to uh, continue to uh, live for at least next 15, 20 years. And he had jokingly also said, let's see who lives longer, the Dalai Lama or the Chinese Communist Party. And, and his words, his recent words, I think it was soon after his 88th uh, birthday when he talked about some kind of feelers, whether it's official or non-official, from the Chinese state or the Communist Party, and that he was ready for talks. How do the Tibetans feel about that? Or what's your reading of that? Well, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been extremely kind. He's uh, he's a globalist. You know, he thinks not just for Tibet and Tibetan people. He thinks about the Chinese people. He thinks of uh, world peace. He thinks uh, good for all entire uh, humanity. So I think. Um, 
just the way His Holiness the Dalai Lama looks at uh, for a resolution of the Tibet issue, um, it's, it's, it's out of the world. Such a, uh, you know, Buddhist concept and, and approach. Uh, while people like us, we are, we are common, ordinary people. We, we work for our country, our people, freedom of Tibet. Um, so, of course, um, you know, that kind of uh, karuna with which His Holiness the Dalai Lama approaches, not just Tibet, but uh, global issues, uh, he would be much more hopeful. Um, for, for us, our hope comes from uh, what little thing we can do and what little thing or, or support we could uh, garner around from India, from United States or many other uh, places. Uh, so I think, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama constantly looks for uh, what is called the negotiated solution, you know, having a discussion with China. But uh, for people like us, I don't see China making any attempts to, to talk to us or find a uh, resolution. And then really appreciate your time and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, more strength to you and your people. Thank you. And for our viewers, <laughs> do send us feedback on this interview. You can follow our social media handles for the latest articles that we put up on our websites or interviews like this with Tenzin Sundu on our YouTube channel. If you'd like to support us, there is also a UPI code that's flashing on your screen. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amitabh Brady.